All right, hello everybody and welcome. Thank you for joining us for the first in our four part Tuesday series related to the Title IX regulations. Uh, today's program is going to focus on sort of one sliver of the new regulations. And that really is the, the scope of sexual harassment as defined in the final regs. And what that effect is on conduct that falls outside of either the definition of sexual harassment or outside of some of the jurisdictional limitations that we're aware of now. Um, before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items. Um, for those of you that know me, you know I'm loath to read anything directly, uh, but I think I might get in trouble if I don't read this. So I'm gonna go ahead and read the housekeeping items. Uh, Q&A. Questions can be submitted through the Q&A tool and you'll see the icon if you hover over your mouse at the bottom of your screen. While we, or I, will do my best to answer all questions in the time allowed, I will follow up individually should we run out of time. CLE. Today's program has been approved for continuing legal education in both Pennsylvania and New Jersey. We hope to be able to obtain accreditation within other states within our footprint for the remainder of the webinar series. At two separate points during this webinar, we will display and I will verbally announce a couple of CLE codes that you must record and report back to us within a survey that you'll receive via email following this program. We will in turn send you your certification of attendance once we receive your survey response. And now a bit of a legal disclaimer. Uh, the provision and receipt of information in this presentation is not legal advice. It does not create a lawyer client relationship and should not be acted upon without seeking professional counsel who have been informed of the specific facts. All right, so now I'm supposed to read an introduction about Christina Riggs, but I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, tell you who I am. Um, I suspect I know some of you that are listening in today, but for those of you that don't know me, um, I am one of the vice chairs of our higher education practice group. Um, I spend my days working with educational institutions on a variety of issues. Um, and it tends to fluctuate, right? So in the predicament that we are all in right now, I've spent much time on our COVID task force dealing with CARES Acts, higher education emergency relief fund inquiries. Um, but of course, we cannot ever get away from, from Title IX. And so we will be focusing on the new 2,000 pages or 554 pages, depending on uh, which version you were looking at most recently, um, in terms of what these new regulations say, do, change, or don't change. Um, can we advance two more slides? Before I get into what it is we're gonna talk about today, um, I wanna let you know what the next webinar series uh, components are going to look at. Because you might wonder today, gee, I wonder why Christina hasn't actually mentioned anything about live hearings or cross-examinations or things that of course we are all thinking about. Um, what we thought with this webinar series is that we would take four segments and we dive more deeply into them so that we didn't have to spend an entire day. Um, we'd spend an hour and a half at this time every Tuesday for the next three weeks following today on various segments. And each of us, meaning myself and my other uh, either chairs or co-chairs of the higher education practice group, We'll spend some time digging into some of the components of the regulations. So as I said today, we're going to talk really about uh, some of the definitional and the jurisdictional components about these new regulations. Next week, uh, you'll hear from Jim Keller, who I'm sure many of you know, um, on the reporting components and the investigation components. And then the following week, Tuesday, same time, one o'clock, you'll hear from Josh Richards. I'm sure many of you heard from Josh uh, last Monday when he presented uh, via a NACUA webinar, um, but he will be focusing on the conduct proceedings. So a lot of the issues that we're hearing about the live hearings, the cross-examination components, the anti-hearsay questions, all of those things, that's what Josh will be focusing on. And then in our final week, our colleague Jim Taylor will really be tackling a lot of the employment related issues. We realized that a lot of what uh, we were hearing um, was that there were so many pieces of this puzzle that impacted employees perhaps uh, differently. And so we wanted to make sure we had an employee focused or an employment focused webinar that really captured all of the, the, 
the items that we're thinking about, but with a spin or a focus from the employee side of the house. So that's what the webinar series will look like moving forward. So if we could advance one more slide. All right, so now we're gonna jump into our webinar for today. So here is what we know, all right? We know that if you have actual knowledge of sexual harassment that occurred in your education program or activity against a person in the United States, then you must respond promptly in a matter that is not deliberately indifferent, which includes the provision of supportive measures. And as you see these, I've tried to make it clear that all of the underlying terms really should be read as we think of them and as we now know to define them in the new regulations. Next slide, we also know this. We know that if you receive a formal complaint of sexual harassment signed by a complainant who was participating in or attempting to participate in your education program or activity, then you must follow a grievance process that complies with section 10645. But what about this? So if we go to the next slide. What happens if the alleged conduct does not meet the definition of sexual harassment as it's now defined in section 106.30? And what happens if the alleged conduct does not take place within your education program or activity as that is described in 106.44a? What happens if the complainant is not participating in or attempting to participate in that educational program or activity? And what happens if that conduct took place against a person who is located outside of the United States? You have dealt with all of these things on your campus. You probably have a process in place right now that deals with each of these four things. But we have to understand what do we do now based on how the new Title IX regulations define and describe certain things. So if we go to the next slide. That is going to be today's focus, right? So in other words, for those situations that do not fall squarely within Title IX sexual harassment regulations, we'll talk about what you must do, what you can do, and then really what is best for your community to do. Before we move forward, I see that we have our first CLE reporting code. Uh, for those that are looking to get CLE credit, the first number is 34819. That's 34819. All right, so let's move to the next slide. In order to understand what we can do with conduct that either falls out the definition of sexual harassment, or perhaps occurs outside of the United States or outside of your program or activity, we need to put all of this into context. And so we need to understand what is sexual harassment as it's now defined by these Title IX regulations. What falls inside of it? What falls outside of it? Because that will help us understand what is likely going to go down the grievance process under Section 106 or 5, and what falls outside, meaning we have a decision point. We need to decide what it is we're going to do with this other conduct. The same is going to hold true for education program or activity. Before you can decide to do or decide what to do with conduct that perhaps falls outside of that sort of uh, jurisdictional limitation, uh, you need to understand what actually falls in so you know where your decision point starts. And then lastly, we are going to spend some time talking about the permissive and the mandatory dismissals. And why is that? So spoiler alert, uh, but I suspect everyone has read it. Um, but there is a component in the new regulations that mandates in certain situations, the school must dismiss the formal complaint if it doesn't meet certain requirements, such as it doesn't meet the definition of sexual harassment as defined in the new regulations. So then the question is, okay, I must dismiss it, but throughout these regulations and actually now in the statute itself it says but that doesn't preclude me from doing something else under my own code so what does that mean so we're going to talk about first the requirements of what you must do when you actually do go ahead and issue a dismissal but then what is the impact of that dismissal what flexibility do you still have to deal with that conduct <clears throat> 
So that's how we're going to set this up before we go about talking about what you might want to think about in terms of decision points and how you might want to either reframe or restructure some of your policies and provisions to the extent that you wish to. All right, so let's move to the next slide. So we're going to first talk about sexual harassment. Sexual harassment, the full definition is up here on the slide. I've highlighted a few items in red. and We're going to talk about them in a little bit of detail here. I will tell you, we will spend the most amount of our time talking about the second prong of the sexual harassment definition. But first, let me go to on the basis of sex. So this is a change from the NPRM or the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking when I say NPRM. With this change, what they, the department did was it moved on the basis of sex up to the top. And when it did that, it was making it clear that for all of these sort of types of sexual harassment, these three different types, they always have to be on the basis of sex. So let me give you an example. You'll see in the third prong, stalking, right? Um, and we'll go through a little bit of how we define these under the Cleary Act and under VAWA. But if you think about stalking, you could stalk someone for a variety of reasons that may or may not be on the basis of sex. And the regulations actually talk about this. So for example, I think the regulations give an example of you could stalk someone because they are famous, right? And you are drawn to that notoriety that that person has. Um, that might be stalking. That might be stalking based on how it would fall within your, your uh, community might be stalking that you'd even want to take action against, depending on who that, I guess, famous person was on your campus. Um, but for purposes of sexual harassment, under the Title IX regulations, it would have to be stalking on the basis of sex. So that is always a component that has to be there. Then let's go to the first and third, because I said we're going to spend a little more time on the second. So the first one is this concept that we are familiar with of quid pro quo, right? I condition um, an educational benefit or service on your participation in unwelcome sexual conduct, right? Now, it's important to note that for this particular provision, and it's the only one that's listed this way, is the person, the respond in a sense, the person uh, conditioning your participation on the receipt of something must be a school employee. Now, I think we can probably all think about situations where one student might be in a position of authority over another student and that student with some authority might condition um, some benefit on the other person's participation in unwelcome conduct. That would not necessarily fall in this prong. Now, of course, that might fall in the second prong depending on the relationship of the parties, it could fall in the third prong. Um, but for the first prong, the quid pro quo, uh, if you're going under that definition of sexual harassment, it would need to be a school employee that is conditioning the benefit or service on the other person's participation in unwelcome sexual conduct. Now the third one. All right, so the third one is, if we saw in the NPRM, they really just included uh, sexual assault as it's defined in, in the Cleary Act, right? Um, but we needed to, and I think that was, that was creating uh, a bit of confusion for those schools that need to comply with both Title IX and Cleary, um, concepts of dating violence, domestic violence, and stalking. And so now we see that, and, and actually they also said that it was defined by the Cleary regulations, right? Which can create a little bit of, um, of nuance uh, based on, uh, the introduction of VAWA and actually what the, the Cleary Act statute says. So for purposes of this one, what I encourage everyone to do is actually go back and take a look at these definitions, sexual assault, dating violence, domestic violence, and stalking. I suspect that at least our education or our higher education institutions probably have already done so and have already rolled in uh, these four components into their policy. And that's based on what, some, what was required in, in VAWA, which is basically that we needed to have policies in place to address sexual assault, dating violence, domestic violence, and stalking. 
But for those schools that were not subject to the Clery Act, say for example, elementary um, or secondary schools, you really do wanna go and take a look at what these definitions are. Um, with some of these, and I'm gonna just point out a couple of items to know. Um, sexual assault. So sexual assault is a broad definition um, that will include concepts like rape, fondling, uh, statutory rape, and incest. Um, so go in and, and recognize that it is a bit broader um, than, than you might initially be thinking. So it will be roping in a good amount of conduct that you're probably wondering if this falls within the definition. I've talked a little bit about stalking, but dating and domestic violence, it's really important to go and look and see how those definitions are defined. Um, dating violence is uh, it's important and the definition will talk to you about how you decide if someone is in a dating relationship, what do you look at? Um, and then in domestic violence, it's really important to go and look at the components and categories of relationships that can be roped into domestic violence. You'll also take a note that in the Cleary Act, the last component of how you define domestic violence actually relates to whether or not you have something on your, the books in your state or your jurisdiction about domestic violence and how that is defined. So to the extent that you're not already um, aware of those, those definitions, I really implore you to go and take a look at them. Um, for stalking, the only thing I want you to take a note of is the way that stalking is defined in Cleary is a course of conduct. Um, a course of conduct is at least two acts. So um, it would need to be at least two acts of someone uh, engaging in conduct that would meet the definition of stalking. I also want you to take note though, that when we're dealing with this and when we're talking about things that fall within and things that fall without, right? Some of these things, sexual assault, dating violence, domestic violence, stalking, um, they might have definitions in your state. Um, I know that there are certain states with stalking definitions on the books that are arguably different than, the, than how the Cleary Act or the VAWA, or VAWA defines it. So really try and take an understanding as to where those lines are drawn. Um, is there conduct that you are obligated to respond to based on your state law that might fall outside of how it's being defined by the Cleary Act or by the Violence Against Women Act, which is VAWA? Um, if that's the case, then make a note of that, because when we talk about decision points for conduct that might arguably fall outside of these definitions, but you might still want to address, that would be one of those areas that you're going to want to go ahead and, and take a look at. So then, all right, now we get into unwelcome conduct determined by a reasonable person to be so per severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive that it effectively denies a person equal access to the school's program or activity. Okay, so let's break that down a little bit. All right, so if we go to the next slide, this particular segment of the sexual harassment definition has some evaluation considerations that you need to think about. All right, we have probably all by now heard um, or read that there is a reasonable person standard that we are going to need to apply when we're looking at this sort of second provision of how sexual harassment is defined. But you will also read, and I don't want this to create confusion, in the department's regulations, uh, particularly the preambles, we all know the preamble is the, is the length of, of the document. Um, the preamble, the department says, well, it's both subjective and objective. And I don't want that to confuse anyone. So what they're saying is it's subjective when you're determining whether or not the conduct was unwelcome. So sure, if the conduct, when you're trying to decide was it unwelcome conduct, you can look at it subjectively. But when you get to the point of deciding if it was severe, pervasive, objectively offensive, and if it effectively denied equal access, you need to make those determinations uh, based on the perspective of a reasonable person in the shoes of the complainant. Right. So then that begs two questions. Okay. So that begs the question, who makes the reasonable person evaluation and how should that person make that evaluation? So if we go to the next slide, who evaluates? Well, the statute doesn't 
decide, right? The statute doesn't say it has to be this person. It basically says the recipient, meaning the school has to make this, dis this determination. But there is at least one place in the exceptionally long preamble um, that suggests that it might be, or could be, or at least the department um, would consider it appropriate uh, for it to be the Title IX coordinator, right? So where is that segment? So there is a, a portion of the preamble that is talking about, and it breaks it down, it talks about severe, pervasive, uh, objectively offensive, denial of equal access. In the objectively offensive uh, portion, it, it has this provision, and it basically says that it would be inappropriate to evaluate objective offensiveness by sort of shrugging off uh, unwelcome conduct as boys will be boys, or making some other sort of similar assumption on bias or prejudice. When it says that, it actually moves, uses the phrase, it would be inappropriate for a Title IX coordinator to evaluate conduct for objective offensiveness, and then goes on. So what can I tell you about that? So that doesn't mean it has to be your Title IX coordinator, because the statute doesn't say that. But it does suggest that the department is at least contemplating that your Title IX coordinator, who is presumably trained uh, in this area, would be part of that decision or could be the person making that decision. So I tell you this so you at least have a basis if you're having a discussion with your Title IX coordinator about why they might be the right person. Now, if you decide that it's not the right person for it to be the Title IX coordinator, you still need to make a determination now before you get to your first case as to who is going to be that person that is going to make the reasonable person determination as to four things. Is the conduct severe, pervasive, objectively offensive, and effectively denies equal access, right? So that's where the reasonable person standard comes in for those four components. And you should make sure that you know uh, who is going to be making that evaluation. Right. So then the next question is, but how, how do they make that evaluation? All right, so if we move to the next slide. So again, this is not set by statute either. It just says that it must be severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive. But it doesn't tell you how to do that. Now the preamble, and I've given you actually a few pages to read here. Um, it's two pages. I know that it's three, and when I'm using uh, references, by the way, to these pages, I am referring to the regulations as they were final in the Re Federal Register. Um, so the 554 pages with the three columns, right? These are the pages that I'm referencing. Uh, this will go through really the determination about severe pervasiveness and objectively offensive. Uh, overall, thematically, it really suggests that this could be fact intensive. And it doesn't really, and this is gonna be probably important for a lot of the secondary and elementary schools, it, you can include consideration about a complainant's age, right? Their disability status, sex, and other characteristics. And it basically says you can use your common sense when you're making this determination. The only sort of definition, if anything, that we get is on 30156 in the preamble. And what that says is, that this determination must be made in light of known circumstances, depending on the facts of each situation from the perspective of a reasonable person standing in the shoes of the complainant. So there's not a really great definition other than it is a bit fact intensive, you can take into account known circumstances, and you can use a common sense approach. Now, how to evaluate denial of access. The reason I broke this out is I just want to make sure people are uh, familiar or have taken note of the word equal in here, right? So it's not denial of access, right? Which is how I actually wrote the question. It's I wanted you to focus on equal access, right? Because that's how it's written. And what that means is it's really just measured against the access of a person who has not been subjected to the sexual harassment. Um, what doesn't it mean? And we've seen this in case law, so this might not be completely um, uh, new to somebody. To some, uh, it doesn't require that the complainant has already suffered a loss of education. There doesn't have to be a total loss of education. 
right? So we've seen many cases where a student is, is dealing with uh, sexual harassment, but they are still excelling in their grades. Um, that is okay. What the, the department has basically said, and they say this at 301.69, um, if, if you're in a situation where the conduct so undermines and detracts from the victim's educational experience, then you likely are in a situation where they have been effectively denied equal access. Um, so I'm just gonna take a quick second here. Um, all right, so I see a quick question about the slides. Uh, will they be shared? Uh, I believe so, yes. So we can make these available afterwards. Um, all right, so then on this, uh, this provision, the equal access provision, I've also provided you a few uh, pages to read. Again, I tried not to give you all of the pages, right? The, the preamble is so long, we could cite to a number of pages, but this is where I think the department is at least hone in on some of those areas that I think would be most helpful and at least give you um, a basis or a starting point for some of these uh, evaluation considerations. All right, so if we go to the next slide, here's something I want you to take note of. All right, so when we talk about the reasonable person standard and looking at making sure the conduct is severe and pervasive and objectively offensive, that does not apply to the first and the third definitions of sexual harassment. Okay, so the quid pro quo and the Cleary and VAWA offenses that we saw at the end, you don't need to sit there and determine, is this so severe, pervasive and objectively offensive that it effectively denies that person equal access? So what does this mean, right? One of the biggest concerns that we saw here was when we first thought about how this could be defined, we said, well, what if I have one rape, right? That's not pervasive, but that's severe. Well, Cleary Act, the definition of sexual assault would include rape. And so because you don't have to make that same um, reasonable person standard or consideration, that would be included within the definition. Another example is, okay, but let's take the flip, right? What if I have someone who is constantly slapping someone on the butt, right? So that is pervasive, but depending on how someone looks at it, it might not be severe. Well, fondling is one of the components of how sexual assault can be viewed. Um, and so, the only thing, so that could be considered within the definition of sexual harassment. Um, the only thing I wanna uh, discuss for a moment is, so fondling is defined in a way is that it's sort of the touching of the private body part of another person, and I'm paraphrasing here, um, for the purposes of sexual gratification. So it's the only element in here that has some intent. The rest of them really have no intent component, right? It's just without consent. Um, so for fondling, the department doesn't help us very much. It says, well, if it's for purposes of sexual gratification, right? And that really is how it's defined. I will tell you this because it's how those of us that fall, work in the Cleary world have, have thought about this. Um, and this is not to say Title IX and Cleary, while they are similar, they are not um, entirely overlapping. The department goes to lengths to say that. But I think that this, this concept of it, well, how do I know if it was for sexual gratification really, um, I know, caused some people in the Cleary world to, to pause and think a little bit um, and sort of get confused. So we had an old handbook that basically said if it was for sexual gratification, um, you had to make that determination before you could consider it fondling. Um, the Cleary example was a guy goes running down the street, slaps someone on the butt and keeps running by. And in the Cleary world, um, the idea was, okay, well that happened, but we don't know what that man's motive was. Was it for purposes of sexual gratification? Was it a bet? Was it just something done on a whim? Um, and that caused some confusion. The department in the newest version of the handbook said, okay, if you're looking at it for fondling, um, you might not always be in a situation where immediately off the bat you know if it was done for the purposes of sexual gratification. Um, if the victim reported it as something that was presumably done for purposes of sexual gratification, then you could at least, for Cleary purposes, statistically count it as a fondling. 
Now I tell you this not because that it should be the catch, the end all and be all for how you view these things, but I do think it will help you suggest sort of a gatekeeping function, right? So if a, if a victim comes in and makes a report of someone groping them uh, in on uh, a sexual body part, um, and they define it as something that made them feel as if it was done for, for purposes of sexual gratification, then at least for the initial stages, you probably want to proceed. You probably don't want to dismiss it outright just saying, well, we don't know yet. Um, now, of course, we'll get to the concepts of dismissal, right? And one of those things is if it doesn't meet the definition. Um, the concepts of dismissal are something you want to continually look at from the beginning of your process through it. Um, and so I will talk a little bit about what you learn at the onset. I suspect that my, my colleague, uh, Jim Keller, who will be talking about the receipt of formal complaints, the reporting and the investigation, will remind you about considering um, the concepts of mandatory and permissive dismissals throughout the investigative process. Um, so again, I just don't want you to read that in the preamble and get a little bit confused about the fondling concept. Um, I would be careful about using that gatekeeping function um, at the onset. Of course, if the investigation you know, proves something otherwise, uh, then you can take it from there. Um, but that might be a little bit of helpful guidance about uh, taking some of those types of conduct and, and proceeding forward. So if we move to the next slide, we talked a little bit about what falls inside. But what about what falls outside? Um, I've actually talked about a number of these, but I really want you to think about, okay, what are the things that don't meet this definition? Because those are gonna be the things that we need to decide how we're going to handle them, right? So conduct that is severe, but not pervasive, right? You could have someone that could make uh, such an aggressive statement um, that it is, so severe, uh, but it was said once, um, right? Maybe that is something that would fall outside. Maybe it would be something that, um, you know, might not even be conduct that you would consider, right? So statements, of course, can roll in concepts of First Amendment and, and speech protection, um, but you might have a situation where something was so severe, but not pervasive, and what do you do with that? You might have something that's pervasive, but not severe, right? The person that constantly tells the inappropriate jokes. They might be objectively offensive. Um, they might be pervasive, but are they severe? Um, I also talked a little bit about stalking, right? Not on the basis of sex. Uh, there's, an, there's not actually note on page. That is note number 772 incredible that there's that many footnotes, um, that really gets to this point of, uh, for purposes of Title IX and these Title IX regulations, uh, stalking must be on the basis of sex. So I give just some examples, inappropriate jokes, certain unwelcome sexual attention, right? Thinking about, okay, let's identify, and I would suggest this, the conduct that we think we commonly deal with or is currently within our policies that would fall outside of this definition. Flag it because that's gonna be the conduct that you need to think about where you're gonna put that um, and how you're going to address that. All right, so if we go to the next session or the next slide. Okay. All right, education program or activity. So think about this as a jurisdictional limitation. Um, and the department has gone to great lengths in their regulations to make it clear that this is not an on-campus, off-campus distinction. And so try, do try and think about it as a jurisdictional limitation and less so as a geographical limitation, as that might help a little bit. Education program or activity is still broad. It's still all operations of the institution. It could be locations, events, or circumstances whether on or off campus, over which the institution exercises substantial control over two things, the respondent and the context in which the sexual harassment occurs. That is going to cover a large majority of the items that you typically deal with, putting aside the concept of outside the United States, which we will talk about. It also includes, and this is as a direct result of comments that they received. It includes any building 
owned or controlled by an officially recognized student organization, such as a fraternity or sorority house. Now I will tell you, um, the department has, this sounds a lot to those of us that do Cleary, a lot like one of the components of non-campus uh, Cleary geography. Department makes very clear, we are not equating education program or activity with all of Cleary geography, and we are not necessarily including everything that falls within a non-campus uh, definition. And so while this may sound familiar, you really do want to stick with the terms and the phrasing as it's listed in the Title IX regulations. You know, that said, the Title IX regulations do not define what controlled by means. Um, because it sounds a lot like Cleary, uh, controlled by under Cleary basically means you have a written agreement to use. So like a rental agreement, um, a lease, something like that that would fall short of owning the building, but still has the ability to, to use it. Um, so it's any building owned or controlled by an officially recognized student organization. And this really came through with comments that said, a lot of the things that we deal with that may traditionally fall within sexual misconduct um, would happen on off-campus houses and off-campus Greek houses. So, if we go to the next slide, the concern is what still falls out, right? What happens if the house is owned or controlled by an unrecognized student group, right? So what happens if we do recognize a fraternity, right? So. Fraternity is recognized in January. Fraternity is de-recognized in March. Something bad happens in April inside that house, right? So one of the tricky issues you're going to see uh, below is how often do we track recognition? And do we need to broaden our notification when we de-recognize a student organization, right? In, you know, nowadays, it seems as though when a student organization, particularly a Greek student organization, is de-recognized by an institution, it is more public. It is something that is made um, more widely known. But that might not always be the case. And there might be a delay in when we de-recognize and when we actually notify our campus. And that delay might be 24 hours, 48 hours, but something could happen within that 24 and 48 hours. Um, and so you might have a student that would say, but I thought they were, and now they're not. And so what happens to the conduct that happened to me? Now, the short answer is you will probably still deal with that conduct, uh, whether or not it's a recognized or not recognized student organization. But it is going to have to be a decision point that you think about. Um, there are also other student groups, right? So the, the soccer house, right? Um, the lacrosse team, right? So, and I'm not picking on sports or Greeks exclusively, um, but a group of students that live together uh, that happen to all be on the same team is not necessarily the same thing as a house that is owned or controlled by a recognized student organization because it is the individual members that are signing the lease versus the organization. So we really want to think about well, what do we do um, for situations that happened in the soccer house, as an example that I used. So a privately owned off-campus apartment. Also, what about a private vehicle? A lot of things that we will see um, oftentimes are not always inside of a building. And so I don't want to restrict our thinking to that. Right. So what happens if something happens in a private vehicle? Uh, traditionally, we will think about that as still as a, that conduct that impacts uh, one of our students or our employees um, in their pursuit of our education program or activity. Uh, but that might now fall outside of at least how education program or activity is defined, depending on it, for presumably or arguably where the, the vehicle is located. And so you do want to sort of think about some of these odd scenarios now because you will benefit from the sort of clarity of thought later. Okay, um, outside the United States. So this is an area that I don't spend an entire slide on um, because it is exactly as it's stated. Um, when they say outside the United States, it means the person who is experiencing the conduct 
was located outside the United States. The department uh, basically comes to this determination because it says, you know, it, it sticks to the language of Title IX, a person located inside the United States. And so what it says is that if the conduct happens to a person who is located outside of the United States, then that person, then that conduct is technically not regulated by these Title IX regulations. Now again, now this is study abroad, this is an international trip, right? One of our students, one of our employees is abroad uh, and something happens to them. Again, this might be conduct that you still handle, but you do wanna think about what process are we going to use? What's the implication of using the same or a different process? Okay, so give me one second. Um, all right, so I'm getting a question. So sorry, as you see me getting so close to the screen, I have terrible eyes. Um, all right, so here is one question. Uh, assume that a complainant alleges that a respondent sent a nude photo of her to 1,000 people. Would the determination of pervasiveness look at con the conduct of the respondent one time and maybe not pervasive or the impact on the complainant, arguably pervasive? Um, so in that case, uh, and I want to I wanna actually follow up, if I could follow up with the attendee after, I actually think this is an example um, that they use in the regulations um, that I, I don't think sitting here I can put my hands on immediately. But um, I think from that perspective, uh, pervasiveness um, is not necessarily limited to the number of times it occurred. Um, if that person sent the photograph to a thousand people, then you could arguably look at that as that action 1,000 times over. And so I think that you have a good argument that that did meet the pervasive misconduct, though it was the sending of it one time, uh, it was arguably sent 1,001 times. Um, and so I think you could look at it that way. I do believe that there was an example in the regulations. Um, so I'm happy to follow up, follow up offline. Um, if the, the questioner just wants to shoot me an email, I will do so. Okay, so... Let's go to the next slide. All right, so dismissals. The reason that all of this becomes important, the reason we're having this entire session is that in this particular section of the statute itself, 106.45b3, there is a requirement, at times mandatory and at times permissive, that if Conduct that's alleged in a formal complaint, let's start with mandatory, meets one of three things. It says that you must dismiss the formal complaint, right? And so therein lies the issue. If we must dismiss it, does that mean we're done? Does that mean we can't do anything with it? I will tell you that it doesn't mean you are done. It does not mean there is nothing you can do with it, um, but it does mean that you need to think ahead about how it is you would deal with that. So let's talk about the mandatory components and then the permissive com components, right? So the conduct alleged in the formal complaint does one of three things. And I don't think these will surprise you given what we've spent our time speaking about so far. The conduct would not constitute sexual harassment even if proved. Now that is sexual harassment as defined in 106.30, right? So this is really the taking it as it's it's really your intake process that you probably have right now but took everything as true if this was proven would this meet the definition of sexual harassment the answer is no then that's a mandatory dismissal and we're going to go over in the next slide what that means and actually how you have to uh, almost the paperwork for what you have to do in terms of dismissing um, it did not occur within your education program or activity right so we've defined education program or activity what happens if it happens in one of those private off-campus apartments. Um, if it did not occur within your education program or activity, then you would need to dismiss. And again, and, and similarly, if it happened to a person located outside of the United States, those would be mandatory. You do have permissive dismissals. What this means is exactly as it says, you could, you don't have to, right? 
So permissive would be if the complaint notifies the Title IX coordinator in writing that they would like to withdraw the formal complaint or the allegations they're in. Two would be if the respondent is no longer employed or enrolled. Right? And the last one, and you can already tell I have it written there, use this one with caution, right? Specific circumstances prevent the recipient from gathering evidence to sufficient to reach a determination. So I think I've pulled up the right segment. So, and I pulled this up right before we got started. So the department is very clear about using this particular situation is not the same as making a judgment call on the outcome, right? This isn't the time where you look at it and think, huh, I really just don't think this one is gonna end up in a finding of responsibility or you know, I just don't think this is the one we want to move forward on. That is not the case. There must be specific circumstances that prevent you from gathering sufficient evidence to reach your determination to even get to that point. And you are going to need to explain to that point. Um, I cannot seem to locate the area that I was looking, so I'm just going to move ahead um, and go to what you need to do if you actually use one of these. All right, so let's go to the next slide. So if you issue a dismissal, and this is if you, if you issue a, a dismissal under the mandatory provision, or if you issue a dismissal under the permissive, doesn't matter which one you're doing it under, you have to do this. You have to promptly send written notice of the dismissal simultaneously to the parties. That written dismissal also has to include the reasons. Why are you dismissing it? And so that's why I'm saying with caution on that last one on the permissive slide, you need to be able to explain the specific reasons why you were incapable, right, essentially, of gathering the evidence sufficient to reach the determination stage. You then also have to provide an appeal option to both parties equally. Um, and those are the things you must do. In a sense, it's the, it's the paperwork you must meet um, if you issue a if you issue a dismissal. But, and this is said countless times throughout the preamble and actually in the statute itself, you can still take action under another provision of your conduct code. And that is in the statute at section 106.45 B3I. Now here's a query I have. I don't know the answer to this right now. Um, do you have to wait to proceed under another provision of your code until after the time for the appeal has run out? I suspect the answer is yes. I suspect you don't wanna find yourself in a situation where you've issued a dismissal, you've given the parties a chance to appeal and you, are, you start down the path of a new conduct proceeding or a different conduct proceeding um, before they've had an opportunity to appeal. It's not specifically listed, but you want to make sure, I think, that you work in enough time uh, in your procedures to account for that. All right. All right, so we have another question come in. Um, what if an investigation starts out as conduct-based, but during the course of the investigation, it meets the definition of Title IX. Do you need to start from the beginning under your Title IX procedures? Well, I think the answer would be yes, to the extent that how your conduct proceeding began was different or vastly different from your Title IX procedures. And the reason for that is um, if you end up somehow with a formal complaint, so that's a signed document by the complainant that alleges conduct that meets the definition of sexual harassment occurring in your education program or activity against a person located in the United States then technically under the procedures or under the regulations, you have to follow a grievance procedure that meets 106.45. And so um, you need to think about how the other 
procedure started, um, whether or not you had a formal complaint, um, and you know what changed in the process that you didn't have before. But I think ultimately, the answer is, you, if you have something that meets the definition of a formal complaint that meets the definition of sexual harassment in your education program or activity to a person located in the United States, then you're supposed to follow a grievance procedure for 106.45. And failure to do that could arguably be um, a Title IX violation. And so that could get tricky, I understand, because you've started another process. Um, but you'd want to think carefully. I think that one would be a little fact specific, what the conduct code look like. But ultimately, you'd need to make sure you're meeting the provisions of the grievance procedure required under Title IX if you meet those other components, formal complaint, definition, et cetera. Okay. All right, so if we go to the next slide. Okay, so remember this question. Right, so keep talking about definitions, dismissals, and what do you do, right? What if the alleged conduct does not meet the definition of sexual harassment as defined in 106.30? So I've given you one example in the preamble. There are countless examples in the preamble as well as the section that is referenced in this provision. The final regulations do not preclude action under another provision of your code of conduct. And that is clearly stated in this particular section 106.45 B3I. Um, so if the conduct does not meet the definition of Title IX sexual harassment, it doesn't mean you can't handle that through some other proceeding. If we go to the next slide, you also have these questions, right? So what if it didn't, and I've posed these, what if it didn't happen inside your education program activity? Um, what if the complaint is not participating or attempting to participate? What if it happened to someone located outside the United States? Again, this is just an example, and this is embedded throughout. Um, nothing in the final regulations prevents a recipient from addressing conduct that's outside the department's jurisdiction due to conduct constituting sexual harassment occurring outside the, your education program or activity or to a person outside the United States. So if we go to the next slide, back to today's focus, right? You have flexibility. It, throughout these regulations, it says you can still handle this conduct. The questions then become, what must you do? What can you do? And it really may, in many ways, come down to what is best to do for your community. Um, so before we move on, I see we have our second CLE reporting code, and that is 77460. Again, that is 77460. Okay, so if we go to the next, uh, the next slide. All right. You have flexibility. So not only does the department, and I, I like this particular quote, because not only does the department say, you could handle it if you wanted to under some other provision of your code, in a sense it says that might be a good idea, right? So Title IX is not the exclusive remedy for sexual misconduct or traumatic events that affect students. And then this part, the department emphasizes that sexual misconduct is unacceptable regardless of the circumstances in which it occurs. And recognizing jurisdictional limitations on the purview of a statute does not equate to condoning any form of sexual misconduct. So essentially what the department is saying, we put in jurisdictional limitations here, person located in the United States, education program or activity, but just because we did that does not mean we are condoning other forms of sexual misconduct and couple that with all the other provisions, particularly in the statute itself, which says you can do something other other provisions of your code of conduct. And so then we get back to the questions, what is right for your community? So if we go to the next slide, okay. It helps to, I think, compartmentalize this into three categories. Now, there are branches for all of these, but 
the array of conduct that we see on our campuses can get rather large. And so to really compartmentalize what conduct are we talking about? How are we going to deal with it? I think it really helps to start with three broad categories. So what happens to conduct that falls outside of perhaps the definition of sexual harassment, but occurs in your education program or activity to a person in the United States? So that example is a professor rubs a student's back one time, right? That would, and hasn't conditioned it implicitly or explicitly on any benefit. So it doesn't fit the first part. Uh, it's a back. It wouldn't necessarily meet the, the fondling elements uh, within sexual harassment uh, under Cleary. Um, and it arguably, if it's one time, it's not pervasive enough. It might not be even severe enough. Um, and so you might not fall within your definition of sexual harassment. But it's your professor touching a student. Do you want to do something with that conduct? Um, the second category. So the conduct falls within the definition of sexual harassment, but it's outside of your education program or activity or to a person outside the United States. So this could be a rape at a private apartment uh, or a rape that happens to someone abroad. And then what happens if it does both, right? What happens if it's conduct that falls outside of the definition and also falls, falls outside of the definition of education program or activity and to a person outside the United States? So persistent sexual remarks uh, during a semester abroad. All right. So I would help, I think it helps to think about in those three broad categories. Now there are, as I said, branches that can come off of that. So let's go to the next slide. I think it is helpful then to play out various approaches. All right. So before I get into the, the four uh, approaches that I have here, you'll see at the bottom, I have sort of a caution on a serial process. Um, right, so if you were to have a situation where um, some conduct falls within, some conduct falls without, um, outside of sexual harassment, you really want to think carefully about, well, let me run it through my sexual, um, my Title IX policy first, and then either we get a determination of responsibility or not, and then I take the rest of the conduct um, that might fall outside of the sexual harassment and put it under some other process. Um, for some schools, you might have uh, a double jeopardy um, situation. For public schools, uh, you might also have uh, arguably an issue with your retaliation process, unless that's laid out uh, from the beginning. Um, and so you really wanna think about extricating this conduct goes here and this conduct goes here. In fact, the department does uh, one section of its preamble. Um, there is a component that says you basically you don't have to perform mental gymnastics, right? If you have all of the conduct, some of it that would fall within, some of it would fall without, you're not technically precluded from proceeding with all of that conduct under uh, a grievance procedure that meets the 106.45 uh, grievance process that's laid out. So I do want to caution you about uh, serial processes as, as it is. Um, the four components uh, that I think you want to at least think about, these various approaches. Um, should you just apply a Section 106.45 compliant process for all reports of sexual harassment as you currently think of it, uh, even if that falls outside the definition, right? So you can have a, a Title IX and other similar conduct policy, right? That just happens to be 106.45 compliant. And you would apply the same procedures to all of them. Now, of course, then listen to Josh's uh, session webinar uh, in two weeks, which we'll talk about all of those bells and whistles um, for that conduct process. And you really want to think about, is that the process that you want for all types of conduct? Um, the second sort of broad category, and this is broad ways of thinking of it, is should you apply um, a compliant process for all reports of sexual harassment uh, as you currently think about it, even if it falls outside of your education program or activity? Right? This is your, your true jurisdictional provision. Currently, what is the jurisdictional provision in your policy say? Um, is this a change? Is this something that your students are familiar with, your employees are familiar with? 
Um, I'm not getting into as much detail about the distinction between students and employees and all of the um, issues that you may have to run up against if you're changing your process for your employees, your faculty, if you have collecting bargaining agreements, all of those things, as that will be addressed in, in gym session uh, in three weeks. Um, but you want to consider that. Um, or you take a really narrow approach, right? Do you just apply a 106.45 compliant process only if required to do so, and then send the rest to your traditional code of conduct? Now, that is something that you could do, right? Um, but you wanna think about how that would play out, right? Would you have a scenario where somewhat similar facts would end up with a, a you know, boot and suspenders, uh, Title IX compliant process, um, and another one that would have far less procedural um, requirements as laid out in the traditional code of conduct. Uh, maybe that's okay, and that's that would be permissible, um, but you want to think about how that would end up with the conduct, and also how would your community react. Um, and then is there some other access, right, some other parallel or branch policy that you want to think about that is important to your community. So I just identify a few of them on the other slide. If we could move one more slide, sorry. All right. So does it matter if the conduct occurred inside the United States versus outside the United States? Right. Is that something that is important to you? Is there some concern there, right, about the due process or procedural process that uh, some students would be getting versus other students would be getting for conduct that, apart from its geographical location, um, is identical? Right. Uh, will it matter if it involves an employee respondent versus a student respondent? Um, it, you know, are you saying that we just, if it's an employee respondent, we just, we just have to take certain action because that is so important and vital to us as a community um, and how we respond to things. Um, maybe that's important. Um, what about employee on employee versus student on student, right? Does that make a difference if you have the flexibility, right? Of course, if something is meeting the definition of sexual harassment, uh, in your program or activity to a person inside the United States and you receive a formal complaint, you know what your process is. Um, but this is where you have some flexibility. Um, are you going to make different determinations based on some of these various axes? Um, does it matter? Are you more focused based on the conduct that you typically see on the severity uh, or on the pervasiveness? Um, does that matter? Are there particular categories that you want to make sure get through this type of process versus that type of process? Um, you wanna think about why you would be making those determinations because you will need to explain them, right? It's some way, shape or form. If you change your policy, there is so much focus on Title IX that you will need to explain to your community, we took this route because um, it will probably be driven by your mission and by your values, but you will still need to take a response and explain that. So as I see, um, before we get to another slide, we are getting a number of questions. So if you could give me one moment, I'm gonna take a look at a couple of them and, and move through. Um, all right, so, um, let's see, Biden has already stated that he will roll back these regulations if he is elected. If that occurs, uh, what would be his options for rolling back the regulations and how long might that process take? I don't know how long that process would take. Um, I mean, he'd have to go through the same process to get these removed. Um, and so that could take some time. I do think that that, look, we have, all of us that have been in this industry for quite some time have seen shifts uh, through various departments. Um, guidance documents are different, uh, regulatory enforcement actions look different, um, timing and getting through things gets different, and of course now these regulations look different. Um, 
we recognize that and that is very difficult for schools um, and it's very, very difficult to continue to explain that to our community. That said, uh, unless and until something changes, uh, these are going to be effective come August. And so we still have to make sure that we have a process in place. Um, the, there could be a rollback if we see a change in administration, um, but how that will look and when we will even see that change, it's just too early to tell at this point. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, okay, so uh, here's a question. It says, I was under the impression that if an employee versus employee falls inside the definition of sexual harassment, we have to put that case under this umbrella. Uh, are you saying that we have a choice to take employee, employee sexual harassment outside of the Title IX space? No. Um, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to clarify that. So with all of these axes that you're seeing on this slide that's right here, these are assuming this falls outside of the Title IX regulations. So assuming it doesn't somehow meet the definition of sexual harassment, or assuming that it doesn't fall within a program or activity, or assuming that it happened to someone outside of the United States, such that it doesn't squarely fall within these regulations, does that make a difference? Will that change how you want to handle this conduct? Um, if, it is a, if it is a report um, and ultimately a formal complaint about sexual harassment is defined by 16-30 um, within a program or activity is defined by 1644 to a person inside the United States, you have to meet a compliance process or a grievance process that meets 16, uh, 106.45. Um, and of course, if it's just a report, you still need to promptly respond. Um, but if you have some flexibility, that's what this slide is getting at. All right, uh, let me take one or two more and then I'll, then I'll move on. Um, all right. All right, so if you have a section 106.45 compliant process for all forms of sexual harassment, what would the dismissal process under Title IX look like? So I'm going to assume that this question means what happens if you choose to take the position that for all forms of sexual harassment, whether or not they meet the definition of 106.30 or uh, meet the definition of something that falls outside of that because it's you know, not severe or pervasive, et cetera, one of the examples we used. What is our dismissal process under Title IX? Dismissal process would be the exact same, right? So for all dismissals, um, you need, if you are running it, I think under your Title IX process, um, then, and you are doing a mandatory or permissive dismissal, um, then that's your process, right? If you're not gonna, if you're gonna apply one process meets all, then if you are dismissing it, you basically would need to send a notice to the parties uh, explaining simultaneously that you are dismissing it, why you're dismissing it, and give them an option to appeal. That's if you're choosing to apply a 106.45 compliant process to everything. And so that's one of the examples of that might be the easiest thing to decide, but there will be components that you need to make sure you're meeting um, for that additional type of conduct. You need to meet all of the, the grievance process requirements um, that are laid out in 106.45. Okay, so let's go back to the slides and then I'll see if we have some time for additional questions. So if we go to the next slide. All right, so we've already sort of touched on this, but can the, the simple question, am I even allowed to apply the same procedures? Yes, you could. Um, nothing in the final regulations prohibits a recipient from resolving allegations of conduct outside of the recipient's education program or activity by applying the same grievance process required under section 106.45 for formal complaints, even though such a process would not be required under Title IX for these regulations. So you are allowed. But you really want to be mindful of any implications of the implications of the example of the question I just responded to, which is, okay, if we do that, we have to meet everything we say in our policy, right? 
We have to basically do what we say we're going to do. So if our policy says we're going to do X, we have to do X. Um, and so you have to meet all of those bells and whistles that we've talked about and that Josh will talk about uh, in his session. You also want to be mindful about uh, implicated state or local laws. Um, so if you wrap in a lot of conduct um, that might not be necessarily required here, um, then you want to think about are there any state laws or local laws that require something uh, different um, or and that would conflict in a sense with some of these. Um, so I give for, you know, example, um, trying to think if you have a state law on bullying or hazing, right, if you if you start roping in other categories of conduct, um, you might have a state law that says you have to do X, you have to apply this standard, you have to make sure you give this process. Um, and so you would need to find, see, and make sure if there's a way to um, make all of those process work together, um, or if you need to somehow branch out a particular type of conduct. So on the next slide, one of the things that the department is very clear about, and I think this is also just helpful for schools to know, because I think a lot of times we jump immediately to what will the, the grievance process look like. Um, but we are going to be in a world where that might not always be the case. And we have now the option for not moving forward, perhaps if there's not a formal complaint, we have options about uh, informal process and so supportive measures, right? So we do wanna think about this. So the department is very clear that you can choose to give the exact same supportive measures to any complaint regardless of whether um, the alleged sexual harassment is covered under Title IX. So for some of those conduct provisions, um, I think you probably already knew this, um, but here is language in the, the preamble that says this, which is if you have other types of conduct that falls within uh, or right outside of the definition of sexual harassment or right falls within the definition of, se of sexual harassment, but occurs to someone abroad or occurs to someone outside of program or activity, um, and you choose to do something different with that conduct, you can still, of course, provide the same supportive measures to any complaint, uh, regardless of whether or not it meets the Section 106.30 sexual harassment definition. Okay, so if we go to the next slide. So this would be my suggestion, right? Be intentional about your approach. I am very big on, on checklists and developing a process uh, because I think that sometimes these items can get um, very large. There can be a lot of moving parts. And I think that particularly in policy creation and in, in a policy that will be actually read by many of your, your students and your community members, um, it's important to make sure that uh, it is thoughtful and formulaic in your approach. So what I would suggest is create a committee and think broadly. You might need subcommittees depending on the, the type of conduct that you're talking about. But you really want to understand your current scope and context. What are our current policies say? Do we have all of the policies that might be implicated, student and employees, um, and not just policies, but agreements, right, as we think about employees? And really understand the scope and the context of the types of conduct that we actually see. And then what I would do is create a list um, of the conduct categories, the broad conduct categories, and identify these would fall in, these would fall out, assuming we meet jurisdiction, right? But let's think about the conduct that we traditionally deal with. Note if there are any state laws uh, that might come into play that we need to be aware of and not lose sight of. Then create a list of context categories, right? This is jurisdiction, when I say context, right? In what context did this happen? What are the locations? What are the events? What are the circumstances that would fall within program or activity? And I think that that's really important. You will need essentially to have a list of what you, under this definition, believe falls within program, your education program or activity. And the reason for that is that you need to train uh, your Title IX coordinator and others involved as to what that means. Um, and as we know, uh, in these regulations, training materials will have to be posted uh, publicly. And so one of the components you need to train is the scope of your education program or activity is defined by the Title IX regulations, 
and that training needs to be posted publicly. So I think this particular one is really important. It will also help you get a true understanding. Um, this is a process that, uh, again, they're not overlapping, but they can have similar items. Um, Cleary geography, right? Where we sort of canvas and we try and create a list and we need that list because we need to know how to adjudicate things. And we need to know how to statistically represent things. And so for this one, um, your context category, I would try and be very specific. Uh, and then, the list of potential processes, right? What are we gonna need? What is different from our current policy that we will need in section 106.45, right? Live hearings, cross-examinations. Maybe you have that, maybe you don't. Some states already do. Um, what does our current code of conduct look like? And are we comfortable sending other forms of conduct to that process? What are some of those you know, issues that might come up uh, that we might be concerned about? And then if you could design a flow chart to consider various avenues, not necessarily this is set in stone the first time you do it, but really think about and see if we wrote everything down one path, are there any glaring issues or concerns? If we break things off in this way, are there any glaring issues or concern? Take a step back, right? Have your committee take a look at it and try and identify it and then decide to map out your approach. This sounds like a lot of work for something that is must be up and running by August. Um, but if you take this work on the front end before you put everything into writing, you'll make sure that things don't get lost in translation and that you don't have as many gray areas um, and that you've hopefully identified all of your gray areas and you know precisely where um, and in what context everything will be flowing. And then to the last slide, I think, before I hit a few more questions the end of the day, right? So the regulation, it sets the ceiling, or sets the floor, sorry, not the ceiling. I think that's really important. You have flexibility, but the overarching thing is you will need to communicate this decision to your community. And so while I've said it once, I think it's important, right? Sort of what is your mission? What are the values of your community? Um, because that's probably what is gonna drive this process um, because you will have to explain this to students, uh, faculty, employees, alumni, your board, um, and really just the public. And ultimately, however you communicate that, that statement may, um, arguably will, show up in a litigation someday uh, by one party or the other who is unhappy with the outcome. Um, can you defend your approach? And uh, I suspect that there are many uh, council on here. There might be other constituents of institutions, but ultimately at the end of the day, you really wanna think about, are we comfortable with this approach? Can we defend why we did this approach based on what we were required to do under the act and what flexibility the act and the regulations gave us? All right, so if we move to the next slide, I think it's just questions. I think we have a couple of minutes for questions. So I'm gonna open this up. Wow, I made my screen so big. All right, let me try and answer a few of these. Um, all right, so when sending the notice, including the reasons for dismissal, um, how much detail do we have to go into as reason? Um, is it a 10 page essay or a couple of sentences? Um, well, the statute doesn't say explicitly uh, how detailed you have to be. Um, so I would stick uh, to what the standard what the standard language is in the statute. We are dismissing this because um, the allegation, the conduct alleged occurred to a person outside of the United States um, or it occurred outside our program or education or activity which is defined in our policy as X. Um, you're going to have to get, I think that the mandatory ones are actually easier um, because they're very explicit. Um, I do think though, if you're saying it falls outside of the definition, you have to be clear as to why you think it's falling outside of the definition. Um, I would give a little bit more there. I wouldn't give a 10 page essay, but I would give a little bit more guidance. Um, you know, the permissive ones, the first one, right? The, the complainant has uh, asked to withdraw, right? So you're going to be 
easy there. The respondent one is no longer employed. Um, you have some, you have a permissive uh, ability to dismiss on that point, employed or enrolled. Um, I think that one could be relatively short. It's that last one, right? That last permissive one. Uh, if you are going to dismiss it on that ground, you have to give specific reasons as to why you're not, uh, you don't believe you're capable of being in a position to collect information to get to the point of a determination. So that one, you might have to give a little bit more detail. Uh, again, though, I am, I don't know what the 10 page essay would be what I would do, but I would one, use that one with caution and to list out the specific reasons because uh, the word specific is actually even referenced in the statute itself. Okay. Um, all right, so I will read this simply because I just, I, I agree with the, the frustration that this, this can cause, right? So if the conduct does not rise to the level of a Title IX violation, right? It doesn't rise to the level of sexual harassment as defined in the Title IX, uh, in Title IX. Uh, the misconduct could be addressed under a student code of conduct that might afford a respondent less process. Um, and therefore a respondent could be expelled for sexual harassment, uh, you know, quote unquote light with less process then it's guaranteed under Title IX, and this makes no sense. And I understand. I, I, I think this is where um, a lot of schools and a lot of comments um, correctly were noting that if you are requiring us to dismiss things that don't fall within your definition, what are we to do? Um, there's going to be a mismatch as to how we handle certain situations simply because of perhaps the location in which they occurred. Um, and I agree with that. And so that's why I suggest when you go through this process to think to one of the, I think the second bullet on my sort of be intentional in your approach was list out the various types of conduct that you're dealing with and try and, you know, as you go through that flow chart, think about those areas where if we do it this way, that is just going to be nonsensical in a sense. Um, and is that something that we are okay with and that we are comfortable with, or are we not comfortable with that approach and how can we modify it? Um, and I agree with that. I, I think that's why I say it should be intentional uh, in how you choose to react to this, um, because that is some of the hypotheticals um, that you're gonna wanna go through. Okay, let's see. Um, All right. Okay, so one of the questions is um, the definition of uh, sexual harassment talks about the denial of equal access to an education program or activity. And uh, that is not traditionally or typically uh, an issue in an employee versus an employee case. Um, and I, un I understand that. And actually, if you, if you read the preamble um, a page, uh, it's a uh, 30169. They actually, the department, although this does, and they've said it, this applies uh, to employees as well as students. Um, it does say, you know, so, in a situation where you are so undermining or detracting from the victim's educational experience, that is a situation where the quote unquote victim dash student is effectively denied equal access. So again, I, I agree, uh, you know, this is one of those situations where I think um, there is almost so much written in the preamble that sometimes, uh, it's not, it, it, in, in and of itself, how it's written lacks clarity. So you are correct um, in that the way education or equal access is written, it talks about educational uh, program or activities. You know, that said, the department has, I think, taken a broader approach um, as to how you view uh, education program or activity. Uh, and it has, I believe, been employed, 
been applied in the employment context. So although it reads differently in the preamble uh, and even could be argued um, as it's read in the statute itself, it would still be a, a applicable in that situation. All right, let me just see. I think we've got a couple more minutes. Sorry, again, I'm getting so close. My eyes are not good. Um, Right, so um, someone has, has identified, right, it hit on a, a big question here. Um, say we don't want to use the procedural requirements like a live hearing with cross-examination unless we have to uh, because they are burdensome and chilling, but how do we explain that, right? Um, however we do, right, the department requires us to do this, so we're doing it, but we don't think it's, you know, a good idea, so we're going to use it in this instance and not that instance and I think the person is correct, right? That's gonna be exhibit A in a future litigation, right? And that is why the very last slide is, um, how are you gonna communicate this, right? So I think there are ways to, I think, craft and address that this is, um, you know, we are following the instruction and the guidance of, of the Department of Education um, and, you know, a, appropriately applying, you know, the updated regulations. You can think about different ways to say it, but read that statement, however you say it, um, a couple of times, have other people, you know, within your organization, take a look at it and read it. I can, I agree. However you decide to approach this, be intentional. Think very carefully about your communication. Um, not only the process, right? The how are we going to do it, and what are the glaring issues, and do we have some of those nonsensical approaches that you know that someone um, appropriately pointed out? Uh, but how do we explain this to our students in our community? Um, because we have spent now years uh, reframing how we think about this and expanding our policies and procedures and, and keeping up, you know, compliance with. The various DCLs that were coming out and then overlaying it with Cleary and VAWA. Um, so we want to make sure that we really think about um, what's right for our community and how we're going to communicate. So I actually think that communication piece is going to be quite important. Um, all right, so I don't know that that gives you the answer to your Exhibit A, um, but I think you're on the right track thinking carefully about the impact that this could have. Um, all right, so I think we have about three minutes left. Let's see. Right, and to that point, someone has just said, you know, what, what's the downside? What's the downside other than the cost of the bells and whistles? Um, thank you for putting that in quotes, as I think I've said that a couple of times now. Um, to having the same process uh, for all prohibited sexual harassment and or activity, whether it falls inside or outside Title IX, and doesn't it uh, unify the process to ensure you don't get tangled up in jurisdictional appeals and, and counter lawsuits later? I think you're right. I think you could take an approach um, that unifies all processes, but just the same way that the last question commented on, if I only apply this for some, not for others, I'm gonna have people that are really upset, right? But if I apply this to everything, even though the department says I don't have to, I'm gonna have people that are really upset. Um, and so it just depends on what your current, I really think it depends on what your current process looks like how different the process could be if you take a very narrow approach here or a broader approach. Um, because presumably, and hopefully you're at the point where your community is familiar with your process. Um, and so it's really gonna be the change that I think is gonna spark the most concern or confusion, um, or perhaps in some ways people will be happy with certain changes. Um, I think the downside is change. I think the upside is change. Um, and so I don't necessarily think there's a perfect one size 
fits all approach here. Um, I think we're even way too soon in these regulations just being dropped this month to even think about or consider or approach a best practice. I, I just think we're too soon to know what that's going to look like. Um, so I think the biggest thing is identifying what would change on your own campus and what would be the impact and the anticipated response of your community to some of those changes, uh, whether it be to narrow or to broaden. So, all right. And I think with that, we have a number of questions that are still here. And so I will endeavor to, uh, to the extent that someone has identified themselves, I will endeavor to uh, reach out to them directly. Um, if you haven't, if you are listed as anonymous, but you wanna reach out to me, um, that's fine. I'm, ha I'm happy to talk about this, um, but I do want to be cognizant of everyone's time as we have now hit 2.30. Um, so thank you everyone for joining. Uh, as a reminder, the next three sessions will happen at this exact same time. So Tuesdays from 1 to 2.30. The next session up will be Jim Keller and he will be talking about how the new Title IX regulations have impacted how we think about reporting and investigations. So thank you everybody for your time. Have a good day.